Hello, Psych2Go viewers. I'm Michelle Rivas, host of Psychology Roundtable on Psych2Go. Our guest for today's live stream is April Simpkins, ambassador and advocate for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, also known as NAMI. April is also the mother of 2019's Miss USA, Chesley Christ, who tragically passed away from suicide in January of 2022. April's fierce advocacy is changing the lives of so many people by spreading the importance of mental health awareness and suicide prevention. Thank you for joining us today, April. It means so much to us. Thank you for having me, truly. Absolutely. So can you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. Um, I have been actually in human resources for close to 30 years. And even now, um, I'm a chief human resources officer for a national organization, um, and I love it. Um, my job requires me actually to go out and speak. And so being the outward face of our organization is part of my responsibility. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a speaking career that spans about 15 years. Wow. Um, I work with two speakers, agents, and I typically talk on topics like um, co corporate culture, diversity, equity, inclusion, leadership, and I've always shared about mental health. That's extremely important. We need diversity in HR for sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, because of the seat in which I sit, I owned my own consulting practice actually for about 18 years until I sold that company. Oh, wow. um, and so worked with literally over a thousand organizations in 15 different industries and had a chance to hear from business owners, but also from their teams. And so being able to really talk about what's impacting workers became my passion. And of course, after um, Chesley passed, my focus shifted a little bit more to talking about mental health and its intersectionality with culture, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and leadership. Absolutely. And you can't talk about mental health without taking into account different like factors such as race or socioeconomic background. So thank Absolutely. you for that. Absolutely. And your story, <laughs> thank you. And your story is incredibly inspiring. You've demonstrated so much strength and grace in the face of losing your daughter, Chesley, to suicide more than a year ago. Can you tell our audience who Chesley was and a bit about her background? Um, Chesley was absolutely an amazing, amazing woman. And sometimes it's still hard for me to talk about her in past tense. So there are times when I will talk about her in presence present tense because she is always with me. Um, she's an incredible, just an incredible individual to have met her uh, is to love her. She was from a very, very young age, academically gifted. And she took that with her all the way into adulthood. She was also uh, an amazing athlete, a musician. She was a philanthropist. She um, supported her community. Um, you know, many people know her list of accomplishments, which includes graduating cum laude from what was then the number one honors college in the country at the University of South Carolina and the Moore School of Business. Mm -hmm. She got her Juris Doctor and her MBA simultaneously from Wake Forest University and then went on to practice law uh, complex civil litigation, licensed to practice law in two states. Um, she competed in several beauty pageants and, of course, went on to win the title of Miss USA in 2019. And after that, became an extra TV news correspondent. Um, she was amazingly smart, but incredibly humble. Um, mm -hmm. Just... Uh, an incredible athlete. She still has records um, at the University of South Carolina in the triple jump. She was outspoken, but she was introverted. Um, she was, you know, she had a solid athlete physique, but there was still something very beautiful and feminine about her. Um, 
she just honestly she just encompassed so many amazing things yeah she literally had the most beautiful hair <laughs> <laughs> like just <Yeah>. hair goals <laughs> the funny thing about chesley is she was actually born bald um wow. did not have much hair at all i remember vividly having to um, like gather up a few strands of her hair and I wrapped some scotch tape around it. And then I would Aww. like snap the barrette. To the scotch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. And then her hair started growing and just kept growing. Absolutely. And she bloomed. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for telling us about her because she truly was an incredible and amazing woman. So thank you. And then, um, you know, Chesley was known to be extremely bubbly and radiant. There was truly a glow about her, like people could see that on screen. Mm -hmm. And not just because of her physical beauty, but like you mentioned, because of her beautiful personality. Yeah. And so many people were shocked when the news of her passing emerged. For our, for our viewers, can you explain what high functioning depression is and how it can be difficult to, de to detect in someone? Yes. Um, mm -hmm very difficult to, to detect. And you know, there's some nuances around the use of that phrase, high functioning depression, because there are many people who um, are battling depression who still show up for mm -hmm. events and still show up for their life. But the difference with high functioning depression is that it's persistent. And it is actually sometimes referred to as persistent depressive disorder. It's just always there. It doesn't really have um, a lot of, of the ebb and flow like a chronic depression. And so because someone with high functioning depression has learned to live in that state, it is very difficult to detect um, if there is some kind of major depression because they do appear to be coping very well. But mm -hmm. that is unfortunately that um, ability to not be detected is part of that level of depression or that type of depression. Um, you know, you, you won't see it. You likely won't see it um, or be able to detect it. There's many reasons why people with the, you know, the spectrum of depression may not share it with someone and choose to keep it to themselves. Um, high functioning depression, because it doesn't where what we consider to be markers of depression, we just assume that person is perfectly fine and perfectly mm -hmm. coping when in actuality they may not be. Exactly. Thank you for explaining that um, perfectly. Chesley, like so many others struggling with high functioning depression, feel like they have to put on a mask often for like the world to see and they're unable to be vulnerable about what they're going through due to various reasons, like you mentioned, such as society or cultural expectations or even the stigma that's attached mm -hmm. to seeking mental health treatment. So how do we fight that stigma so that more people feel comfortable about seeking help? Um. You know, um, I love that you worded it that way. One, one distinction I want to make about um, Chesley is there were some people who knew she was struggling. It just wasn't publicly known. It was not yeah. part of how she branded herself um, for a number of reasons. If I you know, rely solely on the words she left behind, she didn't want to burden someone with wow. how she felt. And that is very common with people who um, either have depressive disorders or are battling high functioning depression. They feel like it's a burden for them and they don't want to burden someone else is kind of how they view it. Um, you know, there, I think the way that we can begin to address that and help others to feel a little more comfortable is twofold. One, we can't change others, but we can change ourselves. And there's so much power in just being kind. And kindness for someone who is battling gives this measure of grace that makes it a little easier to not be okay when we exactly. extend a measure of kindness. And secondly, learn to be truthful ourselves. You know, we look at people who may be battling a mental illness and put the responsibility and onus on them to step forward and say, I'm struggling. When we, um, those of us who may not be struggling in that way, aren't honest with how we're feeling. 
How many times do people say to you, hey, how are you doing? And you say fine when you know you're not fine or you know you're not okay or something's on your mind. So I think we all need to take that lesson in our own advice and be transparent with how we're feeling. And it makes it easier for those who are struggling to also be forthcoming. Exactly. Beautifully put. Thank you for that, April. And it's true. A lot of people, that stigma around it, not just because people feel like they might be a burden, but because of that horrible label of, you know, sometimes people will label someone crazy because they mm-hmm. mention that they have depression or anxiety and that's extremely damaging. And so that's something that we need to, it, it's a societal problem. Would you agree? Yes, so, I would. Yeah. It comes from, you know, just lack of, of understanding. One, mm-hmm. um, You know, one thing I've learned and talked about as a NAMI ambassador is that mental illness extends far beyond anxiety and depression. And anxiety and depression is something that's more common. We feel that. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, mental illness extends to those who are battling bipolar disorder, PTSD, um, OCD, eating disorders. It just extends beyond just those things. And there's so much we don't know. We can't understand. We are then reliant on that one individual to explain how they're feeling. And there's a spectrum. And so it is easier for our brains to just say, this is bad. This is wrong. I don't have Mm -hmm. to process this. When really we just need to give people space to just kind of be where they are and how they're feeling. And the more we just give them space to do that, the more we're going to break that stigma. It's okay to have a bad day. It's okay to not be okay. And we need to make that normal. Exactly. Definitely. And, you know, another thing is you may not understand it, but you can always approach it with empathy. There's no excuse to like lack empathy when it comes to these situations, even if you don't understand why the person's acting the way they are. 100 percent. And, you know, I see that happening in our everyday lives. I see it happening to people, celebrities on TV, especially you know, we'll see someone, I, you know, we've all witnessed this, the cameras will pan in on someone who isn't smiling or looking gleeful. And then we've hit them with the barrage of how unappreciative they are of who they are and their status or exactly. And maybe they're just not okay in that moment. And that is where kindness and grace comes into play. Absolutely. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Thank you. And um, I wanted to know, April, how did you transform your pain into power despite dealing with such enormous grief? How did you find the strength to become an advocate for others? Mm. It was a hard, honestly, um, living with grief is the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, not long ago, I think it's kind of during COVID when there was a woman who was on a talent show and she was battling cancer and she was dying from cancer. Mm -hmm. And she sang this beautiful song about being okay, even though clearly she was in a state of decline. Mm -hmm. And she said something I thought was really profound. And she said, you know, life is never going to be perfect. It is, it's just not, it's not designed to be that way. And we have to learn how to live in the imperfection. And I feel like that is almost a a motto for me. I have to just learn to live in this place of partnering with grief. It just doesn't leave me. There are moments when I feel like I could, you know, take on the world. And then there are moments when I'm just, I can't climb out of bed. And I've learned to accept that that is the way life is going to be, but it will not stop me from living. Amazing. That's so powerful. And it is so true. Like grief, depression, those things ebb and flow. It's not something that just goes away, like some magical cure pill or anything like that. Like it's learning to understand that this is a part of life and, you know, how do I cope? How do I deal? But also there's going to be happy moments too. It's not always going to be this way. Yeah. 100%. And, um, You know, I I saw this meme not too long ago that I thought was absolutely brilliant. And it said, we are not a machine. And it showed all the different places on a scale where your best could land. And today, my best might just be getting out of bed and getting dressed and (laughs) coming down and responding to a few emails. And tomorrow, my best might be stepping on a stage in front of thousands of people to deliver a keynote address. I've accepted that my best isn't going to look the same every single day. And that's okay. That is the part of learning how to be in the space of not being okay. Exactly. 
that that's so powerful that is so true sometimes i feel that way like i only have the energy to get up and brush my hair and brush my teeth yes. and that's it like it's just a bad day and then the next day i'm here doing an interview with an incredible person like you <laughs> and you know honestly um michelle when we let our best kind of ebb and flow we stop comparing every single day to our best day um yes. that's just you know it's just not attainable because there's so many life factors that play into how we're feeling at that moment or that day. And so just accept, I'm gonna do my best today and your best may look different today than it did yesterday, than it will tomorrow. Exactly, and comparing yourself to others and you know, that's that's poisonous. So. Yes, yes, a hundred percent. Comparison yeah. really is the thief of joy. Um, yeah. You just have to live your life. Definitely. Thank you for that. And then, so I was going to ask, what are some coping strate strategies that you that you have um, developed that have, that have helped you manage grief? Mm, one of the hardest that I've really had to work with my counselor on is learning to just feel what I feel. Um, and that, I think, was most difficult. Um, as a mom, I have six children. Um, I'm married. I have my own um, small business on the side. I work a day job. It's very easy for me to learn how to kind of tuck my own feelings and emotions away, put them to the side because I got to focus on something else or my children need something or um, I've got to deliver on a deadline. Um, and so that became almost the coping mechanism to not feel what I feel and to allow myself to compartmentalize and put that on a shelf for a moment. Mm -hmm. But now I've changed that script and I allow myself to feel what I feel. If I'm feeling happy, I will guffaw, laugh. I will laugh till I cry. Mm -hmm. And it feels so good. And in those moments when I am just stricken with grief of missing Chesley desperately, um, I allow myself to feel that. I weep, I cry, I, you know, I talk to my husband. And all of that's kind of kind of new for me. So um, I think one of the things I've learned to do is feel what I feel. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that I've learned to do is practicing self-care, um, which is yes. something else that it's not that I didn't practice self-care, but I've learned now to do it without the feeling of guilt. Oh, yes. <laughs> just do for me and it's okay to do for me. Um, exercising boundaries, learning to say no and be okay with it and not feel like I have to apologize or explain. Um, making sure that I continue to see my counselor focusing on getting sleep. I mean, so many things that I've done ancillary that just help take care of me. Um, I've looked in so many areas where you can just support your brain and your, your um, mental health in general, like mm -hmm. getting good sleep, like exactly. good nutrition, moving your body. All of those things help as well. Exactly. And that is so important. And you mentioned something really vital, which is you shouldn't feel guilt for, you know, extra practicing self-care, right? Why do you think so many people feel guilt around that? Like just for getting the sleep that they need or for doing things for themselves? You know, I, I, I can't speak for everyone. I know that I felt guilt with self-care um, because I always felt like that's something that I should be, I should be doing something for someone else. You know, I need to be doing blank for one of my children or, you know, just to sit still that would self-care sometimes does look like relaxing and relaxing when I know there's laundry that needs to be done or there's dishes that need to be done. <laughs> it's just really, it's hard to do that um, or just get up and go for a walk when I know that, you know, there's some vacuum that needs to be done. But I've had to learn to stop doing that. I think yeah. also, especially, and I bring this up a lot, as moms, we get judged so much. Um, you know, you're you can do so much for your children. Um, and then society will label you as living through your children. Mm -hmm. And then if you back off and do for you, you get labeled as a bad mom who is neglecting your children. And so there's that pull and push. Um, it happens in the workplace. You know, we work, work, work and become workaholics and that's frowned on. But then if you take long vacations, people just assume that you've got a luxury job because you can, you know, go take a vacation. And so, I think that that adds to guilt we may feel for self-care, but you have to do it anyway. And exactly. learning to do that without guilt, that was a, that's a process. Yeah, it's a part of the healing process too, it right? Is. 
It really is. Yeah. Thank you. And now we're going to switch over to our audience segment where we answer your viewer questions. I'm really excited. And so the first one is from Sam. Uh, Sam asks, I'm struggling with anxiety and depression, and I'm afraid to tell my parents that I'm seeking treatment out of fear of them judging me or labeling me crazy. How should mm. I go about this, April? Mm. There's a few things that I would say, Sam. Um, first, if you're not already working with a counselor, work with a counselor. Um, because they can help give you the words you need based on the language you use with your parents um, or those close to you to make it safe. Um, second, decide beforehand how much you want to share. I can say as a parent, sometimes it is scary when you um, see your child struggling with something that you don't feel you can help them with. And so it does become easier as a parent to put up these defenses um, of not understanding so determine on the front side, if you don't feel it's 100% safe, determine what you're going to share um, and let that be a longer term process. Don't feel like you have to share everything all at once. Thank you for that. And then um, the next question is from Jenny. She asked, April, uh, you mentioned the intersection between race and mental health. How can we support more African-American women with their mental health? Mm, you know, a great question. it really is a great question. And I've talked a lot about this, actually, um, this intersectionality of mental health and the black community, especially as black women. Um, it is hard if you look at the racial structure, um, even in our country, um, you know, there's an imbalance that Black people will feel, and then Black women being a double minority coming right out of the chute makes it even harder. And so there is this need to, um, to show more strength. And unfortunately, we can be our worst enemy in trying to mask that or being fearful of accepting help um, because of the stigma that may come along um, of feeling like you're not as strong or you're weak or you need help. And I can also tell you, um, religion and faith is so permeated through the Black community that, you know, you're sometimes made to feel like if you have a mental illness or a mental health challenge, that you're not spiritual enough or you're not prayed up enough or there's something wrong with your connection. And so it's easy to hide. I would say that the best way you can help Black women is to exude grace, dignity, and empathy. And the more you do that, the easier it is to just be in the space that we're in without having to, to feel um, like we need to put on a mask. Thank you for that, April. And then our next question is from Brianna. She asks, uh, April, do you think that mental health classes should be mandatory in high schools and colleges? What do you think about that? Should it be a new policy? Um, I don't know that we should um, make mental health classes mandatory. I do think that mental health education should be incorporated into every subject. It should become its own filter. Um, secondly, I would say getting mental health certified, men, um, mental health first aid certified should be something that we, re, we require of some students. Um, student athletes, I think, is great. Um, there may be other student organizations that want to adopt that as a criteria. I got my mental health first aid certification this year along with my emotional CPR certification. And they became game changers for me, someone who's talked about mental health for decades. Um, it really helps you understand not just the spectrum of mental illness, but how to approach someone, how to talk to someone, and most importantly, how to listen to someone. So I think that's really, really important. It's not that I'm opposed to teaching mental health. I think we have to be careful with who is teaching that. And do we have the budget to put that level of professional on staff in our school systems? Thank you. And then, um, so we got a question from Eli. He asked, April, I recently lost a loved one to cancer a few months ago. How do I make my friends and loved ones understand that I'm just not in the mood to go out clubbing or to you know, make myself available to them? 
Mm, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, declaring your space is really important. And uh, the expectation sometimes that people will understand um, is difficult. I'm sure, I shouldn't say I'm sure, but my guess is that um, they are trying in their own way to help you and maybe don't realize that you're not ready for that kind of help that you will ask or you will speak out when you are ready to re-enter who you maybe were um, at another point in your life. And if you are permanently changed, like I tell people, I'm not the April that I was before my daughter passed. I'm learning this new April because I'm living with a different kind of pain. Um, I have been very clear with where my boundaries are, the things that I cannot handle. Um, I'm very clear with a no and taught them to respect my no. Thank you. And then our next question is from Joel Demetrius Johnson. What is the most important thing to tell people who are new to their diagnosis of depression? This is such an amazing question because a lot of people who are newly diagnosed, it's so fresh to them and it could be very like upsetting at first. They don't really know what to do about it. So what's your take mm -hmm. on that, April? Mm -hmm. um, I would say, first of all, you're not alone. Um, that there is lots of help and there is a community of support available. Connect with that community. There's something about depression. And I can tell you that I um, struggled with depression before Chesley passed and it compounded itself after she passed and then got mixed with um, PTSD and other things that I've had to learn now to live with. And being in a community where people understand um, the language you will now use or the feelings that you will try to describe is so important. I talk about NAMI a lot. NAMI is a national organization. And the one great thing about NAMI is they have physical locations over a thousand all throughout the country. You can visit them at NAMI.org and find a location near you. They do peer to peer counseling, family to family counseling, because the diagnosis of mental illness impacts the entire family. And I love that they have that peer to peer so we can all talk about how we're feeling around that diagnosis. So that is the one thing I would say is find your community. Thank you for that. I agree. You have, you have to have a, a support system. How has a support system helped you, April? Oh, tremendously. Um, my circle got real tight after um, Chesley passed because I needed people who would give me space to not be okay. Um, and, and those people who I've kept closest to me give me, they give me that space. And so that's great. I've learned to say no. Um, I am a national uh, speaker. And I, as a matter of fact, I just finished about a 10 day stretch of speaking on the road from a class at Harvard University to the wow. National Conference of State Legislators and others. Um, and it can be sometimes draining. And so I'm, I'm very, I've learned to speak up for myself and say, no, I'm not going to be able to join you for dinner. I need to go back to my room and just decompress and be alone for a little bit. And I'm perfectly fine to say that and just go and be by myself. Um, mm -hmm. So having a circle has helped, but also learning to speak for myself. Has helped it's called, me. yeah, it's called boundaries, right? Just, you know. Yes. Yeah. And anyone who violates your boundaries shouldn't be in your life, right? Like, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm glad that you said that. And another thing that I will share, um, because family's hard, um, it's difficult, and we want our families to understand, and we want our close friends to understand, sometimes they just won't understand. And that's why connecting with people who understand is so important. You don't have to eliminate um, those people from your circle, but where you are now is going to require a different kind of support. And so that's why I say reach out into a community of people who understand. Include. Yes. 100%. Well, that concludes our audience segment. So now I just wanted to ask you, April, what are your next uh, projects with NAMI and like what are you doing next with your mental health initiatives? Thank you so much for asking. Um, we're getting ready to start a podcast. It'll tip off at the first of the year. Um, we're really going to broaden the conversations around mental health 
Um, as I mentioned, I'm in human resources, have been for about 30 years. So they're going to focus a little bit more on managing mental health in the workplace, um, but also how we manage mental health outside of work and in our in our regular lives. So I'm looking forward to kicking that off next year. I've got some other cool projects that you'll hear more about uh, in the middle of the year. Aside from that, I'm going to continue stepping into big spaces to open up conversations about mental health. That's amazing. Now, are you going to be at the Miss Universe pageant this upcoming year? I, you know, I'm not planning to right now, but that can always change. I absolutely adore every single person at the Miss Universe organization. Aww. They are a family to me um, like no other. And Chesley's um, Miss USA sisters, the way they have embraced me and supported me and taken care of me. I feel like I've got like a, a larger group of children now <laughs> to just love on. And so um, I don't know that I'll I don't know that I'll be there this year, um, but they are very, very close and near and dear to my heart. Um, that's amazing. And you deserve that support. So that's yeah. just amazing to hear. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you so much for joining us today, April. It was amazing. We'll look out for that podcast and all of your initiatives with NAMI. And a thank you to our viewers for your amazing questions and for joining us today. Have a great day, everyone.